chapter number 15, verse number 58. And for those that can and will, if y'all wouldn't mind standing to the reverence of the reading of the Word of God. And then after we get done with 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 58, we're going to go to an Old Testament story. And they say the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Amen. And so I'm going to take a New Testament verse and I'm going to put an Old Testament story with this verse. And I'm praying that it will be a help to us here tonight. And, uh, I have, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't preached this message in years. Something I've had stuck away, and uh, this message is probably at least nine years old. And God's tucked it away, and he let me bring her out tonight. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and so I'm a little bit nervous, but I believe this is exactly where God would have us to go tonight. And so, like I said, I don't have my messages lined out. I'm just following God and what he'd have for us. First Corinthians chapter number 58, and we see here in 15 verse 58, it's probably my life verse. It's the way I sign my Bibles. Therefore, my blood brother. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Can we pray? Yes. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for allowing us to get back in thy word tonight. Lord, I want to say thank you for what you've done here this morning. But Lord, we know this is a new service. Lord, I believe you laid the groundwork for what you have for us this week. Now, Lord, I'm just trusting you to build upon that what you've already started. Lord, I pray you'd touch your messenger just one more time here tonight. Lord, I'm excited, Lord, you've got something bubbling within my soul tonight. And Lord, I don't want to get ahead of you by no means, but Lord, I want to stay right in line with what you'd have for us here tonight. And Lord, I pray that what you have in my heart would infiltrate the people that's looking at me. And Lord, I pray that the Word of God will fall on good ground here tonight. Lord, I know that Satan wants to steal the Word. So, Lord, I'm praying you'd put a hedge upon us here tonight. Lord, I pray you'd guard us. Lord, that you just allow the Word of God to fall on good ground. Lord, that it'd take root and grow thereby. Lord, that we'd be changed from the inside out here tonight. Lord, we're asking for revival. Lord, I believe that you want to send revival. Lord, I believe there's a people who want it. So, Lord, I'm asking that you'd give them the, the desires of their heart here tonight. Lord, I thank you for those that's come, the visitors here tonight. Lord, I'm humbled by that they'd come to be a part of this meeting. Lord, I thank you for the good songs of Zion that's been sung that's prepared our heart for what you'd have for us here tonight. And Lord, I pray you'd lay it out a table before us here that we'd be able to eat, Lord, from the little children up to the older adults. And Lord, I pray you'd just lay out a buffet here tonight before us. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd touch the hearts of your people. Lord, again, I do pray, Lord, it's our desire in our heart, Lord, and I made mention that, Lord, if there's somebody lost among us, Lord, that this would be the glad night they'd be birthed into the family of God. Lord, you said, if I be lifted up, I draw all men unto you. And Lord, I'm praying as we lift your name up on high. Lord, we come to exalt the name of Christ here tonight. Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost would do a work here. Lord, I pray you be with everything that's done. Touch the needs of the hour. Touch the hearts of your people. Lord, again, we ask you for your help and your discernment. Lord, we do love you and we thank you. And we'd ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And you all may be seated. First Corinthians, of course, is the great... Uh, resurrection chapter and talks about how we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye and I'm looking forward to that day and I believe it's nearer today than it was yesterday and I, I anticipate the arrival of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tonight just as much as if it don't come today I'll, I'll, I'm looking for it more tomorrow than I did today and I believe it's going to take it's, it's going to happen just as sure as world I mean we're, we're not we don't go by signs but you can surely see the signs that's happening upon this old world and how it was supposed to be like the days of Lot, the days of Noah, and we're seeing that before our eyes. And the Sodomites are starting to get the rights they don't rightfully deserve, and we're calling evil good and good evil, and we're persecuting those that are standing up for truth and right. We've got the, the coach out in Washington don't know anything about his background being persecuted for praying on the 50-yard line after a football game. I believe he has just as much right to do that as anybody else. And boy, I'm telling you, the Muslims need to get behind him because if they take away his rights, they're going to take away their rights. And I'm not for the rights of the Muslims. Don't, take, don't get me wrong. I believe there's only one God you pray to, and it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you've got, to re, you've got to remember the rights when we fight for our rights, we're fighting for the rights of others, and I do know that. But if we got people being persecuted, and Miss Davis up there in Kentucky being persecuted because she wouldn't give out marriage certificates to the sodomites. And I say amen and glory to God. I believe you need to stand your ground, Miss Davis. And boy, we're living in these days. We're seeing things change. And 
And now we're seeing the, the battles coming against us. And, and yes, there is going to be a change to this old vile body. And it's going to put on the incorruption. And boy, how this old mortal, boy, it's going to be changed. And I'm looking forward to the day that I'm going to drop this old flesh. And I've always said that God's going to take us out of here so quick, he's going to jerk me inside out. And I'm just going to leave this old robe of flesh and this pile of clothes behind. And I'm going to have me a new body. And what that new body, boy, I'm excited about that. Amen. And boy, I'm looking forward to see my Savior face to face and be able to look on the one that saved me by His grace and have spiritual eyes to see Him and spiritual ears to hear Him and boy, be able to be able to worship Him and not get tired, amen. But boy, but the Lord, but Paul in the writing of the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he says, therefore, and boy, our victory coming through the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not out of here. There's still a work left to do. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, because... This is going to happen, and this is going to change. And, boy, there's some things fixing to take place. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, he's talking to the church. He says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I don't want to get tied down in the introduction because I've got a long introduction, but I want to take my time tonight. He says, I can, so that's what we're going to do, amen. And so we see that Paul, he's giving us some instructions here because of what's fixing to take place. He says, therefore, my blood brother, he says, be steadfast. And the word steadfast means sitting, firm, immovable, not wavering, established. But we need some folks established tonight. I mean, we've got some wishy-washy people. And they go with this doctrine and that doctrine. They're blown about. They're double-minded. But we need some folks that'll get right in the Word of God and get established. And boy, we need some convictions. I mean, I like that first song and how that that I can't lose my eternal security. Hey, can I tell you that's conviction? You need to get that settled if it ain't settled tonight. And boy, we see that we need to be steadfast and that firm, immovable. It means not wavering from. I'm not going to waver off this King James Bible, Amen. I'm going to stand firm for what I believe, Amen. I was preaching not too long ago, and my we were riding home, and my wife said, "So we're against that." I says, "We are now." Amen. I mean, <laughs> amen. I, so, uh, but there's some things I'm not going to move on. I and mean, if it's in this Bible, somebody says you're narrow minded, I'm as narrow minded as that Bible right there. Amen. And so we see that we need to be established in the Word of God. Number two, it says un unmovable. It means not to be moved from its place, firmly persistent. Well, we need some folks that are going to be persistent in the work of God. Some folks that are just going to dig their, trent, their feet in the ground and says, I'm not going to be moved from this area. It's like that old tug of war, and I was always the big guy in school, and I was. And I was always the last one picked when it come to football and baseball. And when I finally got picked, they stuck me out there so far, the ball never got to. But when it come to tug of war now, I was always the first one picked. I mean, they wanted this old boy on their side, and they always put me at the end. Said, Brother John, just tie that rope around you and don't move. In other words, that's what we need. We need some folks that'll be, that'll be un unmovable. We need that, that, that to sit on down, anchor on in what God have us to do. Amen. Boy, it talked about how we're supposed to be abounding in the work of the Lord. That word abounding means to be abundantly furnished. Can I tell you, God gives you everything you're going to need to do the task at hand. I mean, God is, I, I can tell you stories, and I can get bound down on this thing right here on how God's how he has abounded us time and time again and what God continues to do. Everything that God's ever called us into, he's paid for. Amen. God's not going to send you out there. If he's got something for you to do and it's, his, his, it's in his will and his perfect will, God will supply the means for you to go do that. He says he's going to abound you. He's going to furnish you. He's going to give you everything abundantly that you're going to need. And boy, I'm telling you, I'm glad that God can abound us. Not only that, it says your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That word labor means intense labor united with troubles and toils. Well, there's days where, I mean, we're living in a day today that troubles and toils at hand. If you're going to work, if you're going to be in this battle for the Lord, I want to tell you, we're seeing some toil coming on. We're seeing some labor. I was there in 1 Corinthians 16, I could go on how they addicted themselves to the ministry. And it talked about how they did that. And they submitted themselves. They were helped and laboreth. And that word laboreth there in that verse of chapter 16, it means to, to labor until you're fatigued. A lot of people don't want to fatigue themselves for the Lord anymore. Well, we're seeing people saying, well, let somebody else do it. No, God didn't let somebody else do it. God put it in your lap to do. And that's what God wants you to do. And if you're going to do something, do it, I mean, until you fatigue yourself. I mean, God's fatigued me here of this month. I don't know what it is about this month of October. Well, I know we're in November. But no, October was a, was a great month for me. 
time. I mean, God allowed me to do some things and travel, and I got to see some folks change and lives change by the grace of God. But last month in October, it seems like I slept the least I've ever slept. God seemed like there was one week in a revival I preached that down in Georgia, and I preached it from Monday to Saturday, and it was like clockwork. Three o'clock, every morning God would wake me up. Every morning. Every morning at 3 o'clock, God wake me up. And sometimes he'd let me to go back to sleep. One morning, he let me sleep in until 3.09. That was really kind of him, wasn't it? And then he'd waller me around for a couple hours. Boy, some folks just roll on over. That's not what God had for me that week in that revival. He woke me up at 3 o'clock. Sometimes you're going to labor until you're purely exhausted. And it seemed like God moved. The more exhausted I was, the more that God did. I think God did that so I'd get myself out of the way and let God do some work. Amen. Well, we need to labor. And it says, and your labor is not in vain. It's not empty. Can I tell you the best thing I know to do is to serve God. Amen. I mean, this is, I love what I do. My wife asked me not too long ago, she says, I don't know if you could work a secular job. I says, I would if I had to. But I says, I enjoy doing what I'm doing for the grace of God and by the grace of God. I says, I love serving him and getting up every morning and knowing that I'm going to serve the, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords and have a small part in his big work. I said, what an honor that is to be able to do that. And so we see it's not in vain. It's a joy to do that, but yet it comes with a cost. Amen. He says, the labor, your labor is not in vain. It's not in yourself, it's in the Lord. If you're going to do anything, you're going to have to do it in the Lord. Now, with that being said, therefore, my blood brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter number 23 here tonight. 2 Samuel chapter number 23. I'm going to get right into the message here tonight. 2 Samuel chapter number 23. 2 Samuel there in your New Testament, and if you go towards the beginning of it and keep coming to your right, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and all, come right on down through the Pentateuch, and you'll run into uh, Numbers, and then, of course, you'll come into Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then you come into First and Second Samuel, and you'll come into 2 Samuel chapter number 23. And I want to look at one of the mighty men of David here tonight with that thought in mind. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I believe God's laying some groundwork here for the week, and I want to just stay right where he has us. In verse number 11, it says this in 2 Samuel 23. And it says, After him was Shammah, the son of a G, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together in a troop where a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground, and that's the Shammah, and it says, and he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great victory. With the help of God tonight, I want to look at this thought. It's nothing original. But I want to look at this thought. This is my pea patch. This is my pea patch. The first thing we see, and I talked about being a discouraged in the Lord, but I want to look at the discouraged people here this morning. The first thing we looked at was the direction in 1 Corinthians 15, but then we see the, the discouraged people. It says that, the, that there was a piece of ground and full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines. The first thing, the reason I feel like they left, well, number one, they fled for a lack of fear. Can I tell you, we got a lot of people that's fearful of doing anything for God because they don't know how it's going to turn out. Got quiet real quick. Amen. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power and sound mind, amen. But there's people fearful about doing anything for God because they look at the giants that we're going to face and the enemies we're going to face. Can I tell you, they are stronger than we are, and they are bigger than we are sometimes. But can I tell you, we've got God on our side, but yet we've got people that won't do anything because they're fearful about doing something for God. They're fearful about failing. I'm telling you, you're going to fail sometimes. I've failed sometimes. I've failed as a dad uh, many a times. And honey, don't amen me, but i failed as a husband. Amen. Amen. But if I let fear take over me, I would never get anything accomplished for God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm fearful in the dark. I don't like walking by myself in the dark. Bigfoot's a lot when I'm walking alone. He's a fictitious story until I'm out there by myself hunting somewhere in the mountains off in some holler up there and my flashlight goes out. You hear that twig break and it sounds like a tree just broke. You just know Bigfoot's up behind you and you're, you're going to die in a moment. Amen. I mean, 
mean, I'm being honest with you. I can't stand walking in the dark by myself. But boy, I'm telling you, you start walking a little quicker, amen. That's the fear I'm talking about sometimes. There's things that's going to make you fearful out there to do anything for God. So we see that they fled for a lack of fear. Number two, they fled for a lack of faith. We're lacking faith in our churches today. Well, that's something that without faith, it's impossible to please Him, the Bible says. But we need to get back to just trusting God. And I'll tell you, I think God centered it up to where that's all we got right there. We've had a really prosperous few years, and the economy was going good, and the ties were going great, and things were happening. It seems like things were rolling, and people were having money, and then the economy crashed, and God took away, and people started losing things. And now we don't have much anymore. Yeah, I, I never have had a whole lot anyway. Boy, but just waiting on God, boy, I'm telling you, it's some of the hardest things you'll do, but it's some of the best things that you will do. Just wait on Him, and I'm telling you, there's people who have fled, and they're not doing anything because just a lack of faith, amen. But we need to get back and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you, we serve a big God. I mean, He's got big hands and got all the big abundant things that we need, and we'll just lay it at His feet and just allow Him to work and put our faith that He's going to do that, amen. I've coined a phrase in our house, and every time something big comes up, I say, well, it's going to be real interesting to see how God works this out. Amen. I mean, and he's worked out. I wish I could tell you some of the things that he's worked out in my life and the things that he's continuing to do. It's just a miracle and how God's doing that. But I, I'm not putting my faith and trust in MasterCard and Visas and Discovers and American Express, but I am putting my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, who owns the cattle on the thousand hills and owns the hills that the cattle are on, amen. And by the way, he owns the grass, amen. Lack of faith. Number three, they fled for a lack of a burden. Boy, I don't want to get bound down here, but I will. Well, we don't have a burden no more. I was at a church not too long ago, and I'm not picking on this church. It's a great church. I preached at this church. And I was there on a Wednesday night, and they put out their Wednesday night prayer list, and I got it at home. I looked at it today, prayed over it today. And I come through that, and I got to praying, Brother Coach, one, one right after another, there was 104 things on that list, 104. And I got down to the bottom, and I prayed over each need that was there, and I said, something's missing. And I went back, and I didn't pray over the list second time. I went and read the list. And I started to take note. There was people on there that had drug addictions and alcohol problems and cancer and heart problems and, and jobs and, and family problems and marital problems and children problems and, and, and personal problems and unspoken and, and it went right on through and it was just list after list after list and I got down to the bottom and I said man it's sad two people out of a hundred and four was for salvation now, now let me some of y'all looking at me funny I'm for God healing people with heart problems. And I pray for those people. And I pray for people that have cancer. And I prayed for a guy on Friday. He had to have nose cancer. He's got nose cancer. He's going to have part of his nose taken off. And he called me out of Tennessee. He said, Brother Jones, would you pray for me? I said, I sure will. And I've been praying for him all week. Pray for him on Friday. when he had the, And I've been praying for him this week. And I'm expecting a call tomorrow morning. And he's going to call me and tell me how it went. I'm expecting that call. And i got a pastor friend in Florida that's got cancer. And he's really doing bad. I pray for those needs. When's the last time we really got down for a burden for the lost? I mean, we're wanting revival. Can I tell you, if we're going to get revival, we're going to have to get the heart of God and back in ourselves and quit praying for something that's temple and let's start praying for something that's eternal. Amen. They didn't have a burden. That's the reason they left. They left because there was no burden there. So we see the discouraged people. We see the discouraged people's story. They say the lentils are a small thing. Insignificant. Can I tell you just a peek? Yeah, I just, I, I, I can't eat them. But I went and I looked at a pea. They ain't but about that big. I mean, really, that's about it. My, my grandmother, she used to make the best split pea soup. And it was good. And them little old peas, about, not that big. And she'd soak them in water and all that. And, of course, they'd grow a little bit. But I'm telling you, they're not very big. And can I tell you something? We look at some things and says, well, that's just a small thing. They say it's just, a, just an insignificant. They say, well, it's just unnecessary to defend. And number three, they say, well, them lentils, you know, they, you can plant them again next year. And they could. 
But what were they going to do in the winter when they needed it? And so we see, and it says, it's not worth my life to die for. That's to discourage people's story. Can I tell you, we have took that in our Baptist churches today, and we have just sort of sat back, and we looked at things, and we're picking and choosing what we're going to fight and what we're not going to fight. And we look at this and say, well, you know, that's just something small, Pastor. Let's don't worry about that. It's amazing to me in Song of Solomon, he says, take up the little foxes that spoil the mind. It's just a small thing, just a little old fox. But boy, he, he starts damaging enough vines, he'll, he'll eventually take out the vineyard. Just a little old thing. So we see the discouraged people's story. But I want to dig in right here tonight. I want to look at the dedicated soldier. The dedicated soldier. First thing he says, he stood in the midst. Can I tell you what we need to do? We just need to just to stake our grounds out and stand in the midst of what God has called us to do and not give an inch. He stood in the midst, it says, and he defended it. And I want to look at some things that are worth defending tonight. Some things that are worth defending tonight. Boy, we need to get back to defending some things that we have let slip in our churches tonight. We're letting it go, and we're just happy and content with coming on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and going to the house. Most people, it's just Sunday morning. I mean, there's some people who've made decisions this morning. They decide not to come back. Amen. 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 There's some, I understand, elderly, they can't. I understand it. But there's some that should be here that has no excuse whatsoever. And I'm going to tell you, there's some things worth defending. Amen. Number one, you ready? i got a list. And a big one. My children are worth defending. Society wants their mind. The government wants their heart. And they're telling us that, hey, you raise them how we want you to raise them. I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to let some stupid TV show raise my children either. And, we, and I mean, there's things going after our children, just one thing after another, one thing after another. I was, I was with a young man, it was a couple years ago, and he was, with, he was working beside me, and, I, and I, he was humming a song. And I said, son, what are you humming? Because I didn't recognize him. He says, well, I'm humming such and such song. And I said, well, who sings that? And he told me who sings it. His name's Eminem. And I said, that's what I eat. I said, what's he doing? I said, and he says, well, he's rapping. I said, that's what I do with my M&Ms. I take them out of the wrapper. <laughs> Amen. So I went back and I studied this old guy out. And can I tell you what that boy was pushing in his mind? By the way, your ear gate affects your heart. He was pumping in this boy, make, making millions. He is promoting killing your mama. That's what he's singing about. He's also singing about burning your girlfriend in a fire. He's also talked about murder, suicide, womanizing, hating women, treating women like dogs, treating other individuals wrongfully, drinking, drugs, pornography, and all the such this one man is singing about and that boy was polluting his heart and his mind with that and I, I made a stand a long time ago before my children was ever born I said my girls are not gonna listen to country music my girls are not gonna listen to rap and roll rap music rock and roll I says I'm gonna allow them just to be filtrated with the gospel gospel singing you know what we listen to coming over here gospel singing you know what they were singing gospel singing you said well you need to let them sow their wild oats you'll always reap more than you sow amen I wish I wasn't raised on that stuff. I mean, I, even to today, my, my dad, he listened to that stuff. And even to this day, I can sing them, them songs. And they'll come up at the most inopportune time. Most of the time, they'll come up in a good church service. And I'm raising my girls up to be pure. Amen. I never get a big amen on that. I don't know why it is. We all think I'm strange. I get the same reaction in every church I ever say that in. Don't bother me now. I've done set my grounds. I'm defending this. And I'm trying to raise my girls. The first time they ever kiss a young man is at that altar when she says, I do. Some of y'all don't like that. But it's worth defending. 
They're starting a fire. I had a young girl two years ago. And I come down this line in a chapel service, and she went behind my back, said, Mr. Jones, don't know what he's talking about. I believe you can do that and be all right. She's 18. She's pregnant, fixing to have a child. But old Mr. Jones didn't know what I was talking about. I am going to defend my children. Amen. My youngest one gets up every morning and reads her Bible. This year she started out on that Bible plan of three chapters a day. And so she had a little calendar. Well, it just says Genesis 1 on, Gen on January 1st. What it said, Genesis 1. Well, on the, on the next day, it said Genesis 4. Well, she did that for about two weeks. And she comes to me with tears in her eyes. She says, Daddy, you messed up. I said, what's wrong? What are you crying about? She says, I didn't know I was supposed to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 4, 5, and 6. She says, I was just reading one chapter, Daddy. She says, I'm not going to read my Bible this year in, the, in its entirety. And she says, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I said, honey, I said, doing better than most. Yeah. I said, we're just going to back up. We'll get them at the end of the year. I said, this little program you're on, the way it's lined out, I said, you'll read it and you'll have some weeks left over in December. I said, we'll get caught up. I said, don't worry about it. Yeah. Wow. Amen. My children are worth defending. Y'all okay? Say amen. amen. How many is mad at me right now for what I said about raising your children up to be pure? Uh, okay, Pastor. Okay, I'm just checking. I'm checking the pulse of this. My wife is worth defending. Amen. I want to kill her sometimes, but she's worth defending. Amen. I have thought about murder a few times. She has too. Probably today, if truth be known of. But I mean, my wife is worth defending. There's so many scoundrels out there today. Amen. That they, they would love to do nothing more than to break up a marriage. That's the reason why you've got to love her like Christ loved the church. Amen. I'm telling you, she's worth defending, praying over. It'd be surprised. I'd, it'd shock, I mean, it doesn't, wouldn't shock me now. But it shocked me how, few, how many husbands don't pray for your wife until she burns the biscuits. It's all right to say amen, wives. Amen. Thank you, sister. But it surprises how few. I pray for my wife every morning. Every morning. Number one, I pray that God will watch over her, give her a good day, keep her safe, bless her spiritually. I do this every morning. God, just touch my wife, protect her, keep her safe on the road. Touch her, she's raising my two girls up because she does most of the job on that. A lot of times I'm gone, so she's got a big load that she has to carry, so I'm praying. And when I'm gone, we usually pray together over the iPhone or iPad because we can do that FaceTime, and we pray together as a husband and wife. But it shock us how many few husbands actually have prayed for your wife. It would actually shock us how many few husbands have brought their wife to the altar and just prayed over. We're wanting revival, aren't we? Yes, sir. I mean, I am. Can I tell you what it's going to take? It's going to take getting our homes back right. right. Our homes are out of sync. Our homes are out of, out of kilter. We've got everything else. I mean, you let the, the, the World Series, there's going to be more praying tonight for Kansas City Royals win the World Series than there is about some husband praying for your wife. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. It's awful quiet in here. Number four, or number three, or number whatever number I'm on. My Bible's worth the fear. What do you mean by that? My Bible reading. Right here. We're without an excuse on this Bible. We've got so many gizmos and gadgets to read our Bible to us. I mean, my iPhone will read my Bible to me. I took it already this year, went through the New Testament in two weeks, reading with it. Did it in two weeks. Matter of fact, you can read through the book of Matthew in two hours. I did that. You can read through the book of Mark in an hour and 45 minutes. You can read through the book of Luke in two hours and 15. You can read through the book of John in two and a half. I broke up the book of Acts in two nights. And then after that, you get in the, in the epistles and you can come through them pretty good. 
But I'm going to tell you, this Bible, if we're going to have revival, we're going to have to get back to this right here. To what is most important is this right here. It's defending this King James Bible. And I mean just getting in it and reading. And, I, and I'm not one of these going to put you under bondage to reading three chapters a day. I'll just say start with one and go from there, amen. And you'll find out, you'll read one. I've got a young man in, in, in the academy. He comes to me last year. He said, Mr. Jones, he said, I'm still reading one chapter a day. He started out there in the book of Genesis. And he was so excited. I asked him where he was at. And he told me he's right on line of the, of the day of the month of there in January. And I mean, he had her plugged in there. And he said, I'm just reading one chapter a day. I said, son, I said, keep on. You're doing better than most. I said, some don't even pick it up until Sunday morning when the preacher says, open your Bible. And then they fumble around trying to find it. I did that one time. I said, open up to the book of Hezekiah. Yeah. I should have prayed and went home after that because I made half church mad at me. Because <laughs> they were turning. Hmm. Oh, my. I'm digging myself a hole already. But my church services are worth defending. How do you defend that? Well, just come. <laughs> did I say that wrong? Just come to church, amen. Man, when the pastor says we're going to have revival, can I tell you what he's asking you to do? Defend it. Come, be here every night, and not because I'm preaching, I'm telling you, I do this at my home church, amen. If Pastor Barton says we're having revival, guess what? I'm at my home church, amen. My pastor, if he's prayed about it and seek God's face and says this is what God wants, guess what? That's what I want, amen. amen. Boy, we, we don't, I mean, and by the way, Sunday school is part of worship. Amen. Amen. We okay? I, don't know, I think we're running well. I really do. I believe God's right on target tonight. I'm going to tell you, our church services are worth defending. I was at a church in Cairo, Egypt this year. And we were walking up the steps. And when we got up to a certain step, the, the men of God stopped me right there and said, Brother Jones, we want to explain this step to you. And I said, all right. And I said, what's so special about this step? They said, well, we had a 12-year-old girl a few years ago get saved. By the grace of God inside that church, I said, well, glory. That's a blessing. And uh, they said, well, that was good. Until the next week, she come, and we disciple her through the week, and we baptized her. I said, well, wonderful. How's she doing? Well, that's what we want to explain to you. She stepped on this step walking out of church after she got baptized, and her brother was waiting on her. And I said, what happened? He said he shot her execution style on this step for getting saved by the grace of God. And yet, it's a struggle for us to come to church. I don't have to worry about some Muslim shooting my head off. I don't have to worry about somebody beheading me. I mean, it's coming to that. But I mean, it's, it's not, I don't have to really worry about that here. And by the way, I'm pretty sure there's probably enough armed men in here that if somebody was to walk in there, it would sound like World War II. Amen. But I'm telling you, we got so many freedoms. And yet we make, make excuses for not coming to church. You're not defending what's ours. And we always complain about, well, the churches used to be full. Well, you not coming is adding to that. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to help you. What else is that's worth defending? My testimony. There's so many people have lost their testimony by living loose. Say you're saved, and on Monday, you go in there and you tell the most dirtiest jokes right with the rest of them. That's wicked. That's wicked. I worked at a job at, uh, it was at, um, it was at a, a plastic injection molding company, and I was their purchasing manager. It's what I did at that, and I bought things for every mold they made. And I had, there were some guys in there, one guy come to me, he says, it's my golden life to make you mess up. Wow. And they'd start telling them awful jokes, and they would one would be across the room, and the other one would be over here, and they'd say, Say, so and so, have you heard this joke? And I'd stop them midstream. This is what I do. I, I just as I said, stop right there, boys. I said, My ears are not trash dumps for you. And I'm not going to listen to that filth. And I says, You're doing it to get a response. Here's my response. Wait till I'm gone. But some like, like to hang around loosely around the edges of that and listen to it, and you're laughing behind the scenes about how dirty that joke is. Gossiping, 
What you're doing, if you're doing all that stuff, you're marring your ministry and you're marring your testimony. My testimony, I only get one testimony, and if you ever mar that testimony, you're done. Because everybody's always going to remember you for who you were. Case in point, the prodigal son, how do we recognize him? He got right with his dad. We always recognize him as the prodigal son. The woman taken in adultery. We always recognize her. She got right with God. God forgave her of her sin. And, but all the time through the scriptures, all we remember of her is the woman taken in adultery. And we got some preachers that have fallen because of women and fame and fortune. And the next thing you know, they're out of the ministry. They're not in the ministry. There's some men that I allowed my children to sit under that I had a lot of faith and trust in. But they got messed up and they grew their testimony. Wonder how many people in here that used to come to this church ruined their testimony. It's worth defending. It's worth getting in the middle and defending your testimony. Amen. Not only that, but our prayer life's worth defending. These are things for a revival. This is just simple revival preaching. It's not running the aisles and shouting and having a good time, I'm for that. But if we're going to have to, if we're going to have revival, we're going to have to get some things defended back in our churches again. And boy, I'm telling you, we need to get back to giving, giving our life in prayer, amen. amen. I mentioned it this morning, and I ain't going to labor long here, but it would shock us how few people actually have prayed for this revival, and yet we're here, but yet you haven't prayed for it. Can I tell you, you're hindering that, that revival, you're hindering this revival. What you just said, this revival is not worth fighting for. This revival is worth fighting for. I mean, there's some little girl demand is, is their life depends upon it. Some young man's life depends upon it. I'm telling you, my children's life depends upon it. Amen. Amen. They've got to have and got to see the power of God, but yet they don't see anybody praying anymore. I, I dealt with a young man just this week. God saved, God, God saved him out of a drunkard, not a drunkard, but a drug addict. That's what he was. And God saved him, and he hasn't touched not one drug for nine weeks. Nine weeks. And that young boy come to me just this week, and he said, Brother Jones, can I talk to you? And I said, sure can. And tears down his, running down his cheeks. And this is what he said. He says, the people in the church are not living it. He says, I want something real. And he says, I'm watching these people that's been saved for years, and you would think they would be more deeply rooted in the Word of God. And he says, what I'm seeing is that people are not living what they're saying, and it's breaking my heart. What do I do, Mr. Jones? I said, get your eyes off of them. Focus in on what God has for you, son. I said, you go full fledged for God. I said, the devil will set up somebody in that church and you'll watch them. And they may not be saved. I ain't going to say they are. And I'm not going to say they're not. But you'll watch them. And God, the devil will use that to discourage you. Who's teaching these children to come down to the old-fashioned altar and pray? I like it to see the little children come. They don't know what's going on. They usually sit up here and while mom and dad are praying. I've seen it, and they look around, and they're looking, and they're putting their head down, and they're looking, and they're looking around. Does that bother you? No, it don't bother me, not one iota. Because what they're doing is they're teaching their children that that altar is important. Where's the tear stained altar? Where's the mascara? And I'm not picking on this church for the coats. I'm not. But I mean, where's the, where's the stains? Where's the teardrops? Amen. It's worth defending. It'd be, you'd be shocked if we really got serious about prayer and say, I'm going to defend my prayer life this week and let's see what God does. Amen. Boy, I believe God would hear from heaven. Amen. I believe he wants to hear from us. He's a listening. Amen. Call unto me and I will answer thee and shew thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. I mean, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Amen. Amen. Pray without ceasing. I mean, the book of James talks about, I mean, I can go through this, and you got that in 2 Chronicles 7. You got the prayers of the saints. In James, you got the prayer of the servant. In, in Matthew, it talks about only this comes by prayer and fasting, the prayer of the sacrifice. But we're not defending it. This ain't bragging or boasting. But we pray twice a day in my home. 
You heard late, we've been praying at night because I had to leave early now. Mr. Coach messed up my schedule. <laughs> and I'm doing his shift. But we pray at night. Oh, I'm telling you folks, it's important. It's worth the thing. I'm laboring on this too long, and I don't know why. But I'm telling you, I believe this would be the center of this revival if we would just get serious and say, you know, I'm going to stand in the midst and I'm going to defend the prayer life. Amen. There's three kinds of prayer altars you need. Number one, you need a church altar. Amen. Amen. I really believe this with all my heart, and I'm trying to be just as sensitive as I can. But I believe there were some people that need to be in this altar this morning that didn't come. So you need a church altar. Number two, you need a family altar. And number three, you need a personal altar. You need to have your own place. I'll move on. Lost souls are worth defending. How many be willing to pray for a lost soul this week? How many have lost folks in your family? Now, how many this week honestly have prayed for them? Not as many. Not as many. I was raised Catholic. Don't let that, don't get nervous. I was an altar boy. I lit the candles. I did it all. Behind the scenes and all that. That's my background. I'll give my testimony, Lord willing, this week. But there was a lady in a church service got up and she says this, and I never got away from that prayer until I got saved. She says, Pastor, with tears rolling down her cheeks, she says, we need to pray for the lost. I didn't know what lost saved independent. Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist, I didn't know what any of that meant. But all I know is that lady, and it's like God took a dagger and shoved it in my heart that morning. And I never got away from the prayer of that lady. Pastor, we need to pray for the lost. Pastor, we need to pray for the lost. I don't know if that's the prayer that God used to get me in, but I know one thing. I never forgot them tears rolling off that lady's cheek. The big ones. She's a precious friend of mine. Prayer warrior. I call her up anytime and say, well, I've got a prayer request for you. And she's one of those who get a hold of the horns of the altar. One of them old-timer prayers. I mean, one of those that gets down and prays and gets on that battlefield and prays on your behalf. Amen. Church, is it worth defending? You want to see revival in this community? You want to get back and quit talking about how it used to be in the old days and it looked like it snowed on these side of these mountains because the men in them white shirts go up there between Sunday morning and Sunday night service, get up in them old rock altars and them old laurel thickets that they had wore out and the dirt was just as clean and could eat off the dirt. They kept it so clean up there. There wasn't a twig or a leaf and they'd carry an old rock up there and they put on that old rock altar. They'd go up there for hours and spend with God before the Sunday night service asking God to save their son, asking God to save their, their daughter, asking God to save so-and-so, asking God to touch that, that old drunkard down the road close down that old bar do this and to do that I'm telling you God can still do it today in 2015 he did it for Percy Ray he can do it for us amen if we just get serious about it amen Where are the Percy Rays, amen, that will be willing to get a hold of God? Where are the Ralph Sexton seniors that are willing to get a hold of God? Where are the McBurnies, amen, that are willing to get a hold of God? Where are the Whittemores, amen, that are willing to get a hold of God, amen? amen. I'm telling you, it's worth defending, I'm telling you, it's worth defending. And we've let too much sleep in our Baptist churches. And I don't know about this church, you may be the cream of the crop, I don't know. 
But I'm telling you this, from church to church that I'm traveling to, I see more things slipping. I see less going about. I see less people quitting, getting discouraged, just say, well, whatever will be, will be. That's just how we're going to live around. We're quitting on God. We're just going to ride her to the rapture while people are dying going to hell. I'm wondering who will be the one that will stand in the midst that pea patch and say it's worth defending. I wonder who will stand in the midst of that pea patch and says, you know, it's worth dying for. Can I tell you my children and my wife? Can I tell you my testimony? My prayer life, my Bible reading. It's worth praying for. It's worth dying for. Straw souls are worth dying for. I mentioned about going to Egypt this morning. I've, this will be my second trip. The first one I went on, more people said, I wouldn't go over there. You could die. I said, I'd rather die in the will of God than I would die in the will of God on the, on the roads of Mills River, North Carolina. Well, what about your family? I said, we serve a big God. Amen. Them souls are worth dying for. I ain't guaranteed I'll make it to Egypt. But I'll go to heaven standing before God knowing I did the will of God by them things. Can I tell you God thought you were worth dying for. Ephesians, I already quoted it. Men love your wives as Christ loved the church. And if you were to take out this old earth and lay it out flat, they say the very spot where they hung Jesus Christ up on that cross is the very center of this old says man you're worth dying for. Right. Sir, you're worth dying for. Amen. And if I'm this worth dying for and I ain't worth a nickel, I'm just a piece of dirt, undeserving of the grace of God. Amen. Need to be in hell, and I'm not going to follow the adjective, just going to hell's bad enough. But that's what I rightfully deserve. That great song says when he was on the cross, ooh, I was on his mind. He thought I was worth dying for back all the way in them years. I say glory to God in the highest, amen. I'm telling you, I'm glad that I'm saved by the grace of God. And I'm glad that he went to the cross of Calvary. He was buried and rose again on that third glorious day, amen. According to the scriptures, amen. He, he says you're worth dying for. He give all. And we're giving so little. Church, shouldn't you quit defending? Years ago, you wouldn't listen to country music, and now you're switching it back to new radio stations on your channel. You used to read your Bible every, very frequently, and now you very, read it very little. The only time you ever pray is when something bad happens in the family. The only time you ever witness to somebody is when you're with somebody else. Some come out of church just out of pure obligation instead of out of joy. It's a joy. I'm going to quit with this. And I don't know why I'm talking to you. I've never told this story. But I was at a, in a waiting room at a local hospital back at home. And I went in to go see a boy, just to witness to him. Daddy asked me if I would go, and I told him I'd be glad to. I'd go. And I went into that waiting room, and they wouldn't let me back there. Wouldn't let me back there, something like what you had today. And I went there just to witness to that boy. And I was sitting there in that waiting room, and I was watching this lady. She just sat right across from me, and she was in tears. The Lord says, speak to her. I says, ma'am, there's something I can pray for you, pray with you, or pray about. This is how she answered me. And I never forgot. She said, my husband is right behind that wall. And she pointed at TV and says, he's right there. Had a massive heart attack. And they don't know if he's going to make it. 
The, the next part of this story is what shocked me. I didn't know what to do. But she says, that's my daughter sitting next to you and her live-in boyfriend. And she can't get a prayer up on behalf of her daddy because she's living in sin. That's what the mom told me in that waiting room. And I said, how tragic that her daddy's fixing to die and the last thing this girl's ever going to remember, I can't pray for my daddy because there's sin in my life. She'd rather have the joy of, of sin for a season than to defend what she should have been defending a long time ago. See, it comes with a cost of not defending what we should be defending. Wouldn't you hate it knowing your daddy's fixing to die and you couldn't get a prayer for him? wonder how she felt. She just hung her head down. And that young lady started to cry. That boy took his arm off of her. And I looked at her. I said, young lady, it would behoove you that you'd get right with God and ask God to forgive you of this sin of adultery and fornication because your dad's fixing to die, young lady. And I said, the last remembrance of your daddy is you sitting right here. And this is what I told her. I said, you're sitting in sin. And your daddy's fixing to go to eternity. Now you're going to have to live with that. I wonder if she could come in here and she could say this. I've labored long tonight and I appreciate your patience. I believe she'd come in here and she'd say, folks, living right. Living holy, living clean, and defending it is well worth it. Yes. Wonder Church, what is this church let slip through the years that it's just you let it slip and you just quit defending it? And you're like the discouraged people and saying, now we can just plan it next year. Can I, my good? Can you plant that next year? She's gone. She's always gone. There's never getting another one like her. It's worth defending. Is that your girl? She's worth defending. There's no planting her back. It's your responsibility to defend that. Whose young boy is this? She's worth defending. You can't plant that back. See, once they lost in rental fields, if they'd have lost that, they'd have lost it forever. You can't plan it back. My name's Robert. What's your name? Can I borrow her? Can I borrow? Can will you come with me? I'm gonna I'm gonna come here. Will you come with me? Come with me. Bring her up here, Mama. Will you bring her up here, please? Just bring her up here. I'm just gonna obey God and I'm done, brother. I'm done. I'm trying to unhook. You go to this church or you just visit it? You're visiting, so you're from, whose church are you from? You just started going. Well, I picked a good one, didn't I? Not to embarrass you, sister. Church, I want you to look. I'm not, I am not want you to look. You can't plant these again. You can't plant them again. What can I tell you? She's not able to take accountability. What's her name? Bailey. Bailey needs somebody to pray for. Her. And I wonder who's going to pray for Bailey. That once she gets to the age of accountability, God will save her. Little Bailey, is she worth defending? How come we're not praying for the Baileys? How come we let this slip? This is the church for today, not tomorrow. But Bailey needs a good husband that's going to love her. Pray for her husband. Would somebody say, Bailey's worth defending? And I'm willing to pray for Miss Bailey and other children just like her. You're cute as a button, I'm telling you. And I know that's your mama. What a blessing. I'm not going to take her. I've got my own wife, amen. <laughs>
How the babes, amen, amen, I'm, amen, I like that. She's defending her mama, amen. Boy, I mean, you couldn't have timed that any better, amen. Thank you, baby. Worth standing in church. No more. The pastor's worth standing in. Amen. I pray for my pastor every day. Asking God to touch him. He's worth standing in prayer, getting up behind him like Aaron and her, and holding up his arms. There'll be some battles, but it's worth it. Everybody stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor, you come on. I don't want nobody looking around. Where's my pianist? Would you come? Somebody, you play piano? Somebody play piano? Here she comes. She's coming right here. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't want nobody looking around, just me and the pastor, please. She's going to play softly. Who would be just honest? I've labored long tonight, and I appreciate your patience. I don't normally preach this long. But who would be willing to say, Preacher, I've quit defending a few things in my life. Would you just raise your hand? Would anybody just be honest? I see some hands, see some hands. Hands up everywhere. not working folks for revival to let things slip who'd be willing all preacher you're just wanting a great